Recording in progress. Here we go. People are joining. Welcome. Welcome. I can see the numbers zooming up participants. I've never done one of these before. I'm Mehdi Hassan. I am the co-founder, uh, CEO, editor-in-chief of a new media company called Zeteo. Thank you all for signing up. You know this because you've paid to subscribe to Zeteo. So I am eternally grateful to you all. We're up to 109 participants. I love people who are on time. I guess this is a mainly non-brown crowd because the brown folks are always late. And I say that as a proud brown late person. Uh, but we started on time. It's great to see you all here. Um, I've never done a Zoom webinar before. I've never done a town hall like this before. Um, but it's an absolute pleasure to do it as we launch the company this week. It's an absolute pleasure to do it with all of you guys who have thrown your uh, support behind Zateo. This company cannot exist without all of you. So it means so much to me that in the first week, and I've just got to, this is a what is this, a brag, a humble brag? I don't know what it is, but we had one of the biggest launches in Substack history. Substack is the messaging um, uh, newsletter platform that we are using to launch Zateo. It's got some big names on there, and we have had one of the biggest launches ever in Substack's history. That's all thanks to you guys. So today, let's see how many are on. 136 participants so far, and that's zooming up. We have a max capacity of, I think, 500. I think six, 700 people registered. Let's see who turns up. We're going to take some questions. Uh, from folks in the audience. Mike Stad has already jumped in with a very psyched to see you. Mike, psyched to see you too. Uh, psyched that you're here. Um, as you get ready, stick your questions in the Q&A box. I will try and answer as many questions as I can. We've got about 30, 40 minutes in here uh, to get through as many questions as we can. I really want Zateo to be a place where people can speak freely, but not offensively, uh, ask questions about actual things that matter, uh, not just the frivolous fluff that you see uh, in some newspapers and on some TV channels. Um, and obviously, I'm sure a lot of you will want to talk about some of the biggest stories in the world right now, including the horror show in Gaza. Um, if you're not, well, you are a paid subscriber, but if you have friends who are not paid subscribers, please do get them to sign up and join. We'll be doing regular town halls like this as we go forward for the big launch in April. Let's go going. I'm going to answer. Uh, oh, Sana Fayaz, by the way, said she's brown and on time for the first time. Well done, Sana. Um, all right. So let's ask Mira Husseini. Let's let me put this question. Let's see if I can make this work. So Mira Husseini, I hope you can all see her question. I think Mira's a woman. I may be wrong. Apologies if I'm wrong. Let's see their question. Where do you see Israel-Palestine in 5, 10, or 20 years' time? Huge question to kick us off with. I don't know, to be honest. I don't think anyone can predict where Israel-Palestine will be in 5, 10, or 20 years' time. Think about where we were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I don't think anyone imagined we would be in this situation. I do think that, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's a very long, dark tunnel. And unfortunately, a lot more Palestinians and many Israelis, I'm sure, too, are going to have to suffer from violence, from oppression and persecution, from growing fascism before we get to that light at the end of the tunnel. But look, I am, you know, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, as I think Gramsci once said. I, I, I do believe in my heart that the Palestinians will be free. And as the great, late, great Nelson Mandela once said, none of us are free. Uh, unless the Palestinians are free. All of our freedom struggles are intertwined. Um, let's keep going. I wish I could give longer answers, but there's a lot of you asking questions. Um, oh, I've got to, got to take this one. Mohammed Shakhatre says, so happy and proud of you. I joined as a regular member, but I want to upgrade to a founder. How can I do that? That is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. $500 if you want to be a founding member, get a signed copy of of the book. I don't know if you can see it over my shoulder, win every argument. You get to talk in the Zoom calls. In the future, we'll have smaller Zoom calls for the founders. Uh, we have a member of my team on the call. Mida, can you hear me? Can you speak? Are you here? I am muted. Can Mida unmute? I don't know if she can. The mod wonders of modern technology. We will find out, Mohammed Shakatri. I'm going to write down your name because I don't know. That's a great question. How do you upgrade? to the founding member. Um, all right, let's get into some uh, substantive questions on, on policy, on news. I'm gonna keep scrolling down. Um, uh, oh, this is, uh, can you, so Ali, Ch Ali Chinoy says, can you reveal who will be joining uh, Zateo? We're gonna have a team of great contributors who are gonna be offering their time to help me out and build this company up. So it's not just the Mehdi Hassan network, but it is actually a platform for wonderful journalists and activists and voices. Um, and I'm going to link um, Ali's question 
with Melinda Thakra, who, who messaged before the chat, I've got it here on the side, saying this is the first day of Women's History Month. Can you speak to how Zateo is going to be an important and inclusive media resource for women's issues and rights? So I want to tie them together simply because a lot of our contributors, I'm a guy, obviously, I'm a man, but we don't want this to be an all-male platform. Uh, we are going to have some wonderful female contributors. I cannot say their names right now because we actually have a media plan, a strategy. I don't know if you know this. We had a pretty uh, successful launch with lots of great marketing and publicity and PR and thousands of subscribers. Um, we are going to have um, some fantastic female contributors, both American and uh, from across the world. And I think people will be very impressed with our roster of contributors. Zateo is not afraid of diversity. I know we live in an America where DEI is now a bad word. You can't diversity, diversity, affirmative action. But no, no, we are proud and we have actively gone out to produce a diverse cast of contributors. We have people from across the demographic and political uh, and global spectrum, and I hope you'll enjoy them. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy reading them and seeing them when we unveil them in April and May. Um, okay, let's take another uh, question. Uh, Yusuf Ali, early Ramadan Mubarak, Mehdi, have Islamists taken over Britain? I'm assuming that's a sarcastic, snarky question. Um, Ramadan Mubarak to you too, Yusuf, from the name. Look, for those of you following the debate in the UK, the Tory government, the Conservative government has gone all out now, desperate, as it's about to lose an election later this year. Full on Islamophobia. Rishi Sunak, the prime minister today, came out and warned about the danger to democracy from mobs and protesters and Islamists and all of the usual phrases that the conservatives use. Suala Braverman, the former Home Secretary, says Islamists run Britain. She was not suspended or had the whip withdrawn for that remark. Lee Anderson, uh, the vice president, former vice chair of the Conservative Party, said Islamists control London and Sadiq Khan. Um, he did have the whip taken away from him, but the rep, but but the prime minister wouldn't say what he said was racist. Can you imagine? I've got to ask you all this question, and Zateo will not be afraid to make these comparisons or point out the double standards. But can you imagine if Zach Goldsmith, who himself ran an Islamophobic campaign against Sadiq Khan in in was it I can't remember what year it was? Um, can you imagine if he had won? God help us all, and was the mayor of London, and Zach Goldsmith is of Jewish descent. Can you imagine if a Labour politician, especially a Brown Labour politician, had said, "Hey"? The Zionists control Zach Goldsmith in London. We would rightly say that is a racist, anti-Semitic trope to say that Jews are controlling politicians or even the Zionists as a substitute for Jews. There's nothing wrong with criticizing Zionism. It's a political ideology. But a lot of anti-Semites sometimes use Zionists as a code for Jews. And what I'm saying to you is a lot of British right-wing and American right-wing politicians use Islamist when they really mean Muslims. So yeah, the answer to your question Yusuf, is no, <laughs> Islamists have not taken over Britain. The Conservative Party has been in charge for the last 14 years. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Michael Connors has a question here. Let's try and pull it up. Sorry, I'm, okay, here we go. Michael Connors says, in 2009, you wrote for The Guardian, the truth is that the dream of two states for two peoples born in the 90s, died in the noughties in the 2000s. He says, uh, what do you believe is the best path to peace and how can a just and lasting peace be achieved? I am a supporter of a one binational democratic state solution. I believe that the best way to solve the problem, or the only way to solve the problem, maybe not the best way, there are no good options in the Middle East, but the only really equ equal, just democratic solution is to have one secular binational state in which both peoples live side by side as equals, as white South Africans and black South Africans have tried to do since apartheid, end the current apartheid, end the current discrimination, and have one state where everyone lives side by side. Why have two uh, states built on uh, ethnicity or nationhood when we live in a world where we're supposed to be moving beyond all of that? Now, you might say that's a pipe dream, that's a utopia, maybe, but that is what I believe should be the democratic outcome. What I would say right now is that it's not about states. It doesn't matter whether you do support a two-state solution or a one-state solution or whatever. What matters right now is, do you support human rights? This is not about states, countries, nations, or governments. It's about people. You know who has rights? Not, you know, does Israel have a right to exist? Jewish people and Israelis have a right to exist. Palestinians, Arabs have a right to exist. Let's focus on people, not states. And right now, Palestinians are being denied their right to exist. They are being wiped out. They are being killed as they try and get flour and bread. They are being killed as they hide in churches and mosques. They are being killed in schools and hospitals. Their culture is being erased. Universities are being wiped out. Population registries are being wiped out. Historic sites are being wiped out. People say genocide, it's also what's called a politicide. It's a dis destruction of the entire people as a political entity. And 
That's what we have to do something about. That's what we have to speak out against. That's what I support right now. Stopping the killing, supporting human rights, fighting for equality. What end state we end up with, that's a secondary concern. All right, great question, Michael. Thank you for reminding me of an article I wrote 15 years ago when I was less gray. All right, let's keep going. Okay, Caroline, uh, Camille B, apologies for the pronunciation. What platforms can we expect content on besides Substack? Well, we're already putting stuff on multiple platforms. We're doing town halls right here on Zoom, but we're gonna do stuff on YouTube very soon. That's coming down the track. We've already started putting our content on Instagram and today TikTok. I don't know, some of you may have seen, I did a video responding to the flower massacre last night which went out on Instagram and today on TikTok. So we're gonna be using multiple platforms, uh, Twitter slash X or whatever you want to call it these days. We'll use whatever platforms are out there. The reason we started with Substack is because you do own your own content, own your own email and subscriber list. You have complete control over uploading your videos. You're not getting shadow banned, you're not getting censored. And that is what Zateo is all about, speaking freely in an uncensored, unfiltered way. In fact, my show, which is coming soon, I do hope you'll all watch it, is gonna be called Mehdi Unfiltered which I'm gonna have some fun with. All right, thank you, Camille B for that question. Um, uh, here's the question, Alan Dykey, let's ask this one. Sorry, Alan, I don't know how you pronounce your last name. I butcher people's names, sorry. Alan, you say I'd love content across many topics, not merely news or politics. How many bureaus will you have? Great question. Geographical bureaus, we don't have the budget yet to have far-flung bureaus. But what I will say is yes, Alan, great question. We are gonna be covering much more than just news and politics. When you see our contributor list, you'll see that we're gonna be talking about entertainment, about Hollywood, about comedy, about culture. Uh, you're gonna see me nerd out over Marvel movies. It's not just gonna be geopolitics and news and foreign policy uh, and culture wars. Although all those issues are important. We are in an election year, both in the UK, in the US, in Pakistan, in India, a lot of big elections happening this year. So we are gonna talk politics, but not just politics. Thank you, Alan. All right. Um, Sadaf Aga, let's go. We're just going to zoom through these questions. How can we help? She says, she says, brown and on time, 12.59, LOL. 12.59, what, I don't know what time zone that is. I can't keep track. We're, we're, we're at uh, four o'clock time zone on the East Coast. How can we help you, Sadaf says? Please put us to work. Simple. It's a very simple request. All of you have paid to be here, and we appreciate that because freedom isn't free. A free press costs money. A media organization like this costs money. Contributors cost money. So I would say to you all, well, you've all paid. How many of your friends or family can you get to sign up as a paid subscriber? Can you get one, two, three? At the end of this call, can you all make a commitment to go away and get just two? One of our investors said, ask them for 10. No, just two. Go and ask two people, one friend and one family member who isn't subscribed to Sateo and say, look, Mehdi's working hard. His team are working hard. The contributor is going to be great. Sign up for six bucks a month if you pay annually. Annually, excuse me, six dollars a month if you pay annually, which is, as I say in my announcement essay, which I'm sure you've all read, is less than the cost of a cup of coffee from Starbucks, which many of you I know are not drinking right now. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, let's keep going. Uh, Andrea, my brilliant 15-year-old daughter wanted me to tell you I respect him and his work a lot. Andrea, that means so much to me. Thank you to you and your daughter. Fantastic, means a lot to me. Let's keep going. Um, uh, oh, here, here we go. Uh, Bilal Khan, how do we save journalism amidst the rise of human-like AI generating content sites? Fantastic question. I'm super worried about some of these AI generating content sites um, which are producing fake news en masse. Um, we haven't made any decisions as to how we're going to use AI as a tale. That's going to be a debate we're going to have to have as an editorial team with some of our investors, with all of you, I hope. So give us your feedback on what you do and don't like about the use of AI in these fields. I'm not an expert on this. What I would say is the best way to avoid the crap that comes from some of those sites is to invest in sites like this, because whatever you think about me, you know, I'm not going to give you pointless, mindless crap. I'm going to give you substantive stuff, even if you don't agree with me sometimes. Let's keep going. All right, let's keep going. Um, uh, yes. Okay, let's take Derek. Let's take Derek Ishmael's question. Did you consider the concerns that some writers had about platforming or hosting fascist content creators? So there was this debate about Substack, and we had our concerns, and we had a very frank discussion with Substack. You know me. I'm very frank. I'm very blunt with everyone. And we had the conversation about uh, this some of the stories that appeared about were Nazis being hosted on Substack, were Nazis being amplified on Substack. We did our investigation, we did our due diligence, and we believe it is a tiny proportion of the people on Substack. Would I, would, do I wish they weren't there? Yes. But would I also say to you that Substack 
is a hardcore uh, First Amendment platform, free speech platform. I'm not, as you know, a hardcore free speech. I believe there should be uh, some restrictions on speech, especially hate speech and violent speech. Um, what I would say to you all is we are on a platform where our content, my content, our videos, your contributions are not going to be censored and where we're going to be safer. One of the reasons we pick Substack is because we can upload videos and podcasts natively, direct here. We don't have to worry about if YouTube shadow bans us or if X suspends us or whatever it is. We will always have possession of our content and you will all be, have, always have access to the content, all the content because you're paid subscribers. Let's keep going. Bear with me. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, great question here from Yasser Shalal. Can you talk about the consequences of the undecided vote in the US election? I'm assuming you mean the uncommitted vote. I'm just gonna assume that's what you're asking about because that's what's been in the news all week. In Michigan, over 100,000 voters went out in the cold and voted uncommitted. And as the Daily Show joked this week, they really must not like Joe Biden if you go out in the cold to say, I'm not gonna vote for you. The people who went out, many of them don't like Joe Biden and for good reason because of what's happening in Gaza. I happen to think Joe Biden had a pretty good domestic record by American presidential standards prior to October the 7th. I actually thought he had a pretty good foreign policy record in Amer uh, for an American president prior to October 7th. He had almost ended the drone war. Uh, he had ended America's longest war in Afghanistan and took a huge hit for it. Um, he had tried but failed to get back in the Iran nuclear deal. That probably wasn't very good on his part. Um, he had rejoined the Paris Climate Change Treaty but then October 7th happened and his foreign policy has been an abysmal disaster since then and his support for Netanyahu is inexcusable and unforgivable, frankly. Now, the uncommitted vote, my understanding, and I've talked to a lot of people in Michigan pushing it, is some of them are saying Biden's dead to us, we will never vote for him again, nothing he does can bring us back. But a lot are saying, no, we want to pressure you into changing policy, changing gear, calling for a ceasefire, conditioning aid. And if you don't listen, this is what will happen. You may lose a state like Michigan, which he won by 150,000 votes in 2020, and which Hillary Clinton lost by 11,000 votes in 2016. So it's a very, very close, tight swing state. And they are trying to have an impact. And I see some people snarkily, Jonathan Greenblatt of the ADL was saying on CNBC earlier this week, they should get involved. They should, this is lazy. You should roll up your sleeves. This is getting involved. Going out, organizing and voting uncommitted is a small d democratic effort. It is a way of airing your voice in a peaceful, nonviolent, and very, very democratic way. The issue is, will Joe Biden listen? Will Democrats listen? That's the big question. All right, we'll keep going. How do you think uh, liberal progressive journalism is a Teo change their approach? I'm sorry, just reading this question again. Okay, so the far right says Burakhan, um, strategically targets people, grabs them emotionally, floods social media with enormous amount of content. Um, this is a great question from Birkhan. It's one of the reasons I launched the tale, because we are outnumbered and rhetorically outgunned in all of the public spaces, just not just in Congress and public life, but in the media, not just in mainstream media, but in independent alternative media. Some of the look at the model that Zateo has adopted. It's a subscriber model. Very few on the progressive side, on the left side, and people amongst people of color or Muslims or whatever group you want to belong to, very few have tried to do this or have done it successfully. We've taken a risk doing this, but I look at the right and I see Ben Shapiro launched the Daily Wire. I believe he now has a million paid subscribers. Barry Weiss launched the Free Press just 18 months ago. I think she's up to almost 100,000 paid subscribers. Tucker Carlson launched Tucker Carlson Network, TCN. I have no idea how many paid subscribers he has, but there seems to be a lot of room on the right for these independent media enterprises backed by you, the reader, the viewer, the listener, the member of the public, the subscriber. So I thought, why can't we do it? Why can't I do it? Why can't I get a bunch of like-minded people and we do it? Because that's the only way to push back in these spaces. The only thing you can do, you know, what I learned from a, a two decades in the media is no point just saying, what about that? Why aren't they doing that? You have to do something yourself. Ultimately, if you're not gonna do it, who's gonna do it? Um, and just to answer uh, Burkhan's point about strategically targeting people and grabbing them emotionally. Yes, the right is very good at targeting people emotionally. Liberals, the left, we're all about, rational argument will persuade you with facts and unimpeachable logic and pew polls and peer-reviewed papers. And as I say in my book, another shameless plug, let me show that this is the British cover to the new paperback out this week, and that's the American version. As I say in chapter two of Win Every Argument, if you're gonna persuade people, you gotta persuade them here, not just here. You gotta go for the heart, not just the head. The right understands that. They do emotional appeals. 
dark emotional appeals, appealing to people's fears and insecurity and anger and prejudice, the border, the migrants, the Mexicans and Muslims coming to kill you. I'm not saying to do that. I am saying, though, appeal to people's positive emotions, the lighter side, the, the better angels. Appeal to people through hope, offer an inspiring vision, present a strategy and a platform that is about solidarity and community and working together and the common good. Too many of our politicians don't do that, and they need to because time's running out. All right, we keep going. I uh, appreciate all of your patience as I zoom through this. All right, answer live. David, Ga David Gavrin says, outside of our subscriptions, how best can we support what you're doing? It's a scary year, and I'm trying to walk the fine line between supporting Biden and expressing the cr criticism some of his decisions richly deserve. David, that is a brilliant question, brilliantly put. First of all, outside of your subscription? Well, first of all, let me thank you for your subscription. I thank all of you, each and every one of you personally, and there's 242 of you in this call on a Friday. I appreciate you taking time out to join us for our first town hall. Um, outside of the subscription though, how best can you support what we're doing? You know, you know how best you can support what we're doing? A is get other subscribers, cynical self-serving requests. But also I would just say, be the best version of yourself. Be the person who is interested in facts. Be the person who is interested in their neighbors. Be the person who's interested in the world. A lot of the problems we have today is because a lot of people just switched off and said, you know, that's someone else's problem. You know what? I'm not going to read the news today or bother to find out what's happening in Gaza or wherever else in the world, Kashmir, Syria, wherever, Ukraine, not my problem. Let's not be those people. Separate to our subscriptions and what media diet we consume, let's be people who actually care about the world that we live in and want to leave behind a world that's better than the one we found. And then all of our other decisions fall into place, politically, media-wise, et cetera, including your voting decision, David. And I'm struggling like you are. All right, let's keep going. Um, Tom Hall says, very excited about this new platform. Thank you, Tom. And your willingness to use R, P, and G words. If you've read the essay, the R word is racism, the P word. I think it's R, F, and G words. <laughs> Tom, Tom threw me. Uh, or maybe the P word's Palestine for Tom. I use three words to mock some of my colleagues in the media who won't say racism fascism or genocide. And I said, Zateo will say racist when people are racist. We'll call people like Trump fascist because they're fascist. And we'll say there's a genocide going on in pa Palestine, in Gaza, as the International Court of Justice says there is a plausible case for. Um, he says, Tom, I'm on the management team at techforpalestine.org. I'd like to know if and how we could collaborate, support each other. Tom, that's great. Please drop us an email, uh, info at zateonews.com. We will try and get in touch or we'll reach out. Thank you so much. It's a bit of a crazy time for us, so bear with us. Um, okay, Priscilla Benitez, what are your thoughts on the latest news that Biden will drop aid into Gaza? I am disgusted. I'll be honest with you, I'm disgusted. The president of the United States, the most powerful man on earth, the commander of the strongest armed forces on earth, the president of the richest country in the history of mankind, the world's only superpower, is going to try and drop aid, which all experts say won't really work and won't feed the people in the way it needs to be done. Rather than just stand up to our ally, the people we fund to the tune of three and a half billion dollars a year, the Israeli government of Benjamin Netanyahu, and say, you know what? We're going in and we're getting the aid in and you're not going to step in our way. The fact that we're airdropping aid into a place that's controlled on almost all sides by our own ally, who is armed by us and funded by us, is beyond ridiculous. And I think right now the situation in Gaza is so bad that these studies are suggesting even a ceasefire tomorrow very important fact here. Even a ceasefire tomorrow, if we got one tomorrow, which we won't, but even if we got one tomorrow, six and a half thousand Palestinians, men, women, and children would still die in the next six months as a result of the dire humanitarian situation on the ground in the Strip. And if they continue as is the Israelis, the Israeli government, the Israeli military, then we will see 58,000 extra Palestinian deaths in Gaza over the next six months. That's shocking. Airdropping some boxes is not enough. We need a ceasefire and we need aid to go in and we need a president who's willing to tell Benjamin Netanyahu this cannot continue, but we don't have that president right now. And the tragedy is, even if he's defeated at the ballot box, we'll get Donald Trump, who will be even more accommodating to Benjamin Netanyahu. Sorry not to be the bearer of good tidings, Priscilla, but thank you for your question. Um, uh, let's keep going. Uh, Zora Mahmood. 
who do you see the key players in the Palestine-Israel conflict, especially around conflict resolution? Very good question. Uh, you know who the key players are around conflict resolution? It's ordinary people. It is ordinary people. It's people on the ground who don't want to be used and abused by their political leaders, who don't want to be in a situation of permanent hatred uh, and antipathy for the rest of their lives. And sadly, right now, I see both populations. I mean, the Israeli population is putting, you know, there are members of the Israeli population who are turning up at the crossing and putting up bouncy castles to protest aid going in and blocking convoys of aid with bouncy castles and eating popcorn and cheering as aid is blocked. That is sociopathic. Uh, we know that, that Palestinians, I mean, anyone who thinks the Palestinians are going to come out of this conflict with anything other than burning hatred for their occupiers, I know I would. If somebody killed all my family, I certainly wouldn't be in a kumbaya, let's have a two-state solution mood. Yeah, again, as I, what I said earlier in the call, there is light at the tunnel. I believe we can resolve this and the people will be free and equal but it's a lot of dark space in between us and that light. Um, quick question from Mashraf Mir. Will you be discussing the ICJ cases? Oh, yes. I guarantee you will be covering the International Court of Justice. We may, I don't want to give away too much, have a great guest on this subject come April, May. Um, okay, let's go to Sumera Wasti says, thoughts on Rishi Sunak's speech today. Unelected PM seems rather alarmed by an elected George Galloway, not to mention the second place went to an independent candidate. It's true, George Galloway, for those of you not in the UK, George Galloway, a kind of firebrand far leftist who used to be in the Labour Party. I have a lot of issues with him, but on Gaza, he's clearly right. Um, got elected using the platform of standing up for Gaza in Rochdale in this by-election and the conservative response is to continue to lose their minds and crap, clamp down on liberties and demonize pro-Palestinian uh, British voters. Rishi Sunak is desperate. He knows he's gonna lose. And desperate conservative politicians all across the world always move to the far right. They always try and kind of energize the worst parts of their base. And we're seeing that with Sunak when he kind of defends Braverman and defends cracking down on protests. And this whole debate in the UK where the Speaker of the House says we have, you know, we had to do this vote about the ceasefire in this way because members of parliament were being threatened by Islamist mobs. I mean, I'm in the US. I'm still waiting to hear. Does anyone in the UK know? Who was in these mobs? Do we have any names? Or was this just a uh, accusation thrown out there to justify outrageous behavior by Britain's ruling class? Um, we'll keep going, We're running out of time. It's already nearly 4.30 here on the East Coast. Uh, Ali Fatom is asking about airdropping, which I already answered. Um, let's keep going. Um, so let us answer Ruthanna Robson. I like the launch description, but want to know how you plan to cover LGBTQ and feminist issues since I didn't see that mentioned. Well, great question. You didn't see it explicitly mentioned, but I think I made it very clear that our site is all about calling out bigotry. It's all about calling out people who demonize others. It's all about people calling out people who are against equality. Uh, again, I can't give away too much, but when you see our lineup of contributors, you will see that we are reflecting a very diverse group, a very diverse group of viewpoints, a very diverse group bunch of backgrounds. So stay tuned for April. Thank you, Ruthann Robson. Uh, let's keep going. Um, all right, Robbie Lepser asks, can you let us know your plans for how accessible you will make your streams and podcasts? I hope you will make all your video streaming podcasts also available as audio podcasts so I can listen to them in the car. Robbie, we're looking out for you on your car journeys. They will be video and audio, I promise you. And then again, Substack's very good at helping us do that. Um, it will be helpful if your programs are downloadable by subscribers. Uh, I will look into that. And it would be helpful if you could post an email address to send to you and your staff about communications. Well, for now, and we might get overloaded because we literally have tens of thousands of subscribers in the first 48 hours. Thank you so much. We are flattered. That is slightly a humble brag, but it's also uh, a moment of gratitude. We have info at uh, zateonews.com. Try that. I can't guarantee they'll get responses because we're probably going to get overloaded. But thank you, Robbie. Um, let's keep going. Uh, okay, let's just quickly. Da, 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 da. Sorry, I'm just going to run through what we got left. Uh, okay, here we go. Where are we going? Where are we going? Why can I not see any? Okay. Um, so Sol Govin asks, with the huge uncommitted vote in Michigan, do you think it will make a difference in the long run? So I mentioned the uncommitted vote earlier. It could, Sol, I don't know. It could make a difference. If Joe Biden listens, if Democrats are smart enough, they can take this moment, because history is going to judge everyone who ignored the uncommitted vote, who ignored the anti-war activists, who ignored the young Jewish protesters in Congress, who ignored the International Court of Justice. History will judge all of those people harshly. 
And near to the top of that list will be Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. If he doesn't change course, even if he changes courses, he'll still be judged harshly for the 30,000 minimum Palestinians killed. That's a conservative number. I hope the uncommitted vote puts pressure on the Democrats to see the right path, but I've seen no evidence of that so far. We could only hope and pray. Um, Todd Keating, first, congrats on the launch. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on Rishi Sunak's address in the UK. Mentioned it, Rishi Sunak, awful prime minister. By the way, can I just say something separate to his horrible politics, separate to his fact he's kind of unelected and a joke fourth conservative prime minister in whatever it is, two years. Why is he so uncharismatic? Matt, his parents spent a lot of money on his private school education, as mine did on mine. And he went to the top university and he worked in the top banks and he's a prime minister of the UK. Have you heard him speak? The man's a robot. The man has the charisma of the lettuce that outlasted Liz Truss. I mean, I don't know how he's prime minister of the UK. I was so happy that a brown person became prime minister of the UK. I was sad it was a conservative. But a brown person who's so uncharismatic, my God, Lord help us. Sorry, I just had to get that out. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Taki Jaffer, as a British person, what are your thoughts about the government funding from MCB being withdrawn, withdrawn funding for the National Interfaith Network? All again, same issue. This is a conservative government shifting to the far right. They talk about other people playing identity politics. You know who plays identity politics? Conservatives do. White conservatives who play white identity politics and therefore make immigrants the enemy, make wokeness the enemy, make Muslims the enemy. There's a reason for that. I'm going to keep running out because we're almost out of time. We're at 4.30. We'll go for a few more minutes. Um, we will say, okay, let's just take Sayyid Raza. What's your plan in the immediate future to use your voice for the people of Gaza? I'm a massive fan for 10 years. Thank you, Sayyid. Happy to be a paid chuffed member. Please get your friends to be chuffed paid members too. Sayyid, my plan to help uh, give a voice to people on the ground in Gaza and to make sure that journalists are giving a platform to those voices. Well, number one, wait and see the contributors. And number two, I'm already trying to give a voice to those people. I was quoting victims of the flower massacre last night on TikTok and Instagram, or today on TikTok, last night on Instagram, in Zateo's very first video, which sadly was on a massacre in the occupied territories. Um, let's go. Uh, David Stephen, what is your view on journalists, presenters from the media, of the mainstream media and their blindness to reality on the ground? Is it a result of succumbing to the pressures of management or actual feelings? How many are quietly disgusted with the way things are being presented? Great question, David. I think a lot of people are disgusted in the media about how things are being presented, but they don't have the power to change things or they're too afraid uh, to do it themselves. I think there's a lot of fear. A lot, you know, People think everything's a conspiracy. It's not. A lot of it is just people either being ignorant or when they're not ignorant, being afraid, worried about their career path. And, uh, you know, I think you should put the truth ahead of your career path. I think you should put principle ahead of your career path. And by the way, not every career path is destroyed by standing up for what's right. By the way, there's reporting out today from The Intercept that Christian Amanpour has complained internally at CNN over their coverage of the Middle East. Now, Christian is a very powerful person at CNN. She can say this stuff. A more junior person at CNN might get fired. I'm not picking on CNN. I'm just giving you an example of a mainstream media company. This is happening in media companies across the world. People are having debates about how are we covering this genocide being live streamed to our phones. And a lot of people are unhappy about it. Um, OK, let's keep going. Um, uh, Shafi Parekh says, congratulations, Mehdi, on your great launch. Thank you, Shafi. What is the off-ramp for President Biden that he can take right now to come to a good outcome for this genocide? Just reading it out loud, there is no good outcome, even if we stop the war tour, as I say. You'll have 30,000 dead, more than a million people displaced from their homes, another 70,000 injured, and as I say, another six to 7,000 people will die just from the dire health conditions. So there is no good outcome. What is the least worst outcome? The least worst outcome is Joe Biden on Monday morning or whatever it is, says there's going to be a ceasefire that we're going to impose on the region as the only superpower and as the people who arm one side and are supposedly trying to feed the other. That is the only good outcome. There is nothing else. All roads lead back to ceasefire. Without a ceasefire, nothing can happen. Thank you, Shafi. Uh, we will keep zooming through. Uh, Vikar Khan asks, it is evident that Netanyahu's leadership is characterized by a pathological narcissism. I'm curious to know if there are any means by which the citizens of Israel can assist him through psychotherapy. The problem is, Vikar, that yes, Benjamin Netanyahu certainly is a pathological narcissist, like his, uh, you know, his ideological bedfellow Donald Trump here in the US. But the problem is too many people in Israel, while they hate Netanyahu, all the polls show people are not happy with Netanyahu, but all the polls also show that Israelis are totally fine with this war. In fact, they want to, a lot of them want to see a much tougher uh, bombing approach from the Israelis. The polling shows that a lot of Israelis 
want more bombs dropped on Gaza. So the problem is Israel as a society has moved to the right in recent years, like a lot of countries. India is another country. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of countries which have moved to the right in recent years. The populace has moved to the right. And it's very depressing because in a democracy, that's what's going to get reflected. Um, let's keep going. Um, all right, Taylor Mikkel asks a controversial question for the left. Following the massacre yesterday with Biden's stance on Gaza and his far right position on immigration that he's adopting, including asking Trump to co-sponsor a bill. I think he asked Trump to come to the border with him. I find it harder as a progressive to see the daylight between Biden and Trump. Where do you see the future of the Democratic Party heading? Two big questions. Let me, I'm, I'm, the Democratic Party of the future, let's park. Let's just talk about the daylight between Biden and Trump. I do believe there's still a lot of daylight between Biden and Trump. Not enough. And I'm with you, Taylor. I'm very depressed about Biden switching on immigration. That was one of the major reasons people voted for him, to, to not have the party that put kids in cages, to not have the party that wants to build a wall, to not have a party that deports. But having even said that, while Biden's moved even more to the right, let's be clear, Trump is a fascist. His main foot soldier, Stephen Miller, his main acolyte, is talking about building camps on day one to round up people from the interior of the US, undocumented immigrants. They're talking about sending national guard units from red states into blue states to round up immigrants, undocumented immigrants. But we all know they'll round up anyone, people who end up looking like me. That is what's happening on the immigration front with Trump. There is still daylight between Trump and Biden. That's again, not to defend Biden. Biden's moved way too much to the right on some of these issues, but Trump is way out there. I mean, Trump doesn't accept democracy. That is what it means to be a fascist. He wants to overturn democracy, make himself a dictator. These are not my words. He wants to be dictator for a day because of course, dictators are only ever for a day, right? And he wants to use the military and put them out on the streets to suppress any protests against him. That's pretty huge. As bad as Biden and the Democrats have been on a multiple issues like Palestine, like immigration, uh, they still believe in small d democracy. There's still people you can pressure. Here's one example I'll give you. Right now, about 60 to 70 members of Congress, can't remember the final number, support a ceasefire, a pressuring Biden. They're all Democrats. Not a single one is a Republican. What does that tell you about the two parties? At least in one party, you have room for people to dissent and try and change things. In the Republican Party, it's just straight up fascist, pro-Israel, pro-ethnic cleansing, white supremacist in many ways. All right, we're wrapping up. Let's try and finish up in the next couple of minutes. Um, let's try and finish. Um, I'm concerned by all the media coverage Trump gets, how it eclipses the coverage for the accomplishments of the Biden administration. How do we get the media to realize how important it is not to let Trump dominate every news cycle as the election approaches? Um, so that's a great question, Amy Goldman. It's been a problem since 2016. Trump sucks up all the media coverage. And actually, when you put Trump in a headline, you get more clicks and more views. Look, I'm torn on this because on the one hand, you shouldn't just give him uncritical coverage and cover every move he makes and ignore, as you say, substantive things that Democrats have done on drug prices, uh, on inflation, on climate change spending, uh, a bunch of things that the Democrats have done well. I mean, the Biden administration on domestic policy has done more on the domestic front than any president since LBJ, probably in the 60s. But yes, the media prefers to cover horse race, who's up, who's down, who said something crazy. Mine torn because I don't want them not to cover Trump either. In fact, I think we need to cover some of the crazy, batshit, crazy, offensive stuff that Trump is saying. Right now, people say to me, did you see the TikTok video of Biden falling over? Did you see him stumbling? And I'm like, do you know who the rival is? Did you see Donald Trump confuse Nikki Haley and Nancy Pelosi? Do you remember how he said he was going to inject disinfectant in people's veins to get rid of COVID? Did you watch his recent speech where he ranted endlessly about the water pressure in toilets and showers? And people are like, no, we didn't see that. People about Palestine. People don't know that Donald Trump wants to deport foreign students who take part in pro-Palestine rallies. Right? People don't know that because they're not seeing Trump on their TV screens. They are seeing Biden being criticized. So it's a fine line to walk between not covering everything he says and giving him you know, too much oxygen, but also critically covering the really dangerous stuff he's doing. And it's really hard. And I think journalists are getting the balance wrong. All right, thank you, Amy Goldman. Let's do one last question. Um, let's do, I'm gonna just quickly scroll. Do, 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 do. Let's take this one. I'm going to end with this one from Wendy Schweiger. My history, my history book club recently read Jimmy Carter's book on Palestine, in which he assigned the term apartheid to the situation he observed over many years as he traveled in the Middle East. He caught lots of flack for that, despite his excellent explanation for using the term. Do you have any thoughts? I do. I do. And my thoughts are, God bless Jimmy Carter for what he said and done since leaving the White House. In the White House, 
He was not a great president. We know about his domestic policy, the economy, etc. Foreign policy, not good. I know he did the uh, Camp David Accords with, with Begin and, uh, and the Egyptians. But I remember Iran, where he backed the Shah, who was a brutal, brutal dictator. Not that what came after was uh, exactly unbrutal. Um, but let's talk about Jimmy Carter since he left office. He has been a champion of human rights. He's helped end multiple diseases. His Carter Center has gone and guaranteed democracy and fair elections in multiple countries. And yes, he wrote a book and said the A word long before it became fashionable for people, even now it's not fashionable, but long before it became acceptable for people to even talk about apartheid. He took a lot of flack for it, yes, but he's still beloved. People are praying for him right now. He's in, he's in hospice care, I believe. He's not well. We can pray for him if you want to pray for him. I pray for uh, anyone who's ill uh, right now. And his wife obviously passed away recently. And look, Jimmy Carter had the greatest post-presidency of any president that I can think of. He helped build houses, end disease, support democracy. He opposed the Iraq war. Um, and he has called out Israeli excesses. Um, I think his obituary will be more positive than most former presidents. On that note, weird note to end on an obituary. Let's end on a more positive note about the fact that we can affect change, both in the Middle East and here in America. I hope Zeteo will be a vehicle to help affect change as a journalistic organization that wants to champion the truth, champion uh, human rights, champion a model of journalism that's actually interested in substantive issues and won't do lazy both, both sides coverage. That's something I assure you I won't do in any part of the world. Please do keep subscribing losing my way. I've been talking nonstop for 40 minutes. Please do keep supporting us. Do keep uh, telling your friends and family about us. Try and get two people, just two people. There's 217 people still on this chat. Just two people. If every one of you gets two people to subscribe, paid subscriber, we will get 400. I'm so bad at math. We will get 400 new subscribers uh, by the end of the weekend. And that will help us invest more in our coverage, in our bureaus, as one early questioner asked, in our contributors, in the kind of video content that we can produce for you. We're in the process of getting our studios up and running. That doesn't come cheap. You saw the trailer. That stuff isn't cheap. So we appreciate the support you have. I have investors, but I'd rather have more subscribers. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us for this call. Stay tuned. Keep an eye on your inbox for emails about our content. We've got some really good stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks as we get ready for the main launch. We'll keep sending you my newsletters and, and, and some outside content that's coming your way. And keep an eye out for any future town halls. It's been a pleasure. Sorry I couldn't get through 212 questions, uh, but I got through as many as I could. Now I'm going to go have a drink of water and I'm going to eat something really unhealthy. Thank you all. Stay tuned. Keep reading Zateo. Bye-bye.